Welcome everyone to Applied Anthroposophy, our Leading Thoughts presentation with Carrie Shushart. This is our first evening uh, with the theme of service. Uh, so it's a very exciting, I can't believe we've actually been through three, theme, three themes together and here we are um, at our final theme together. Um, and I just wanted to wish everyone also a happy equinox and happy spring and wherever you are in the world, I hope you are feeling the spirit of spring springing in your hearts. Um, so let us uh, light a candle if you have one. Um, and we'll do things a little differently this evening. We're going to start with biography. Um, and then we'll move into hearing from Carrie. Laura will give an introduction so you can hear a little bit more about her and then we'll launch right into her beautiful presentation. Um, and I think that's all you need to know from me. You can chat if you need anything. Um, and yeah, I'll turn it over to Chris. All right, hi everybody. Uh, really nice to be here with you all again. Uh, so as Tess said, we're gonna start out with biography work this evening. And uh, just to remind you of the agreements that we work with when we do biography work. Um, the first is that you remain in control of what you share. So when we ask you to recall past experiences, um, you remain in control of how much you wanna share about those experiences with the people in your breakout room. Uh, second, when you're listening, when somebody else is having a turn to speak, uh, practice open-hearted listening. Um, really try to give your, your gift of listening as an act of service to the other. Uh, and then the third is that we maintain confidentiality, that the stories that are shared in the context of these biography exercises um, are, are there uh, for the purpose of, of the person who is doing the speaking to do some <clears throat> inner work. And they're not for you to then share outside of that context. So with that said, um, let's dive right in. And as Tess said, we're entering into this theme of service. And so we're, we're going to have an exercise this evening that uh, allows you to connect with your experiences with service in the past. And so we'll give you two questions to work with. And the first is to look back into your past experience and find a time when you offered a deed of service to another person or maybe a group of people. So find a time when you offered a deed of service to someone else. And to add a little twist to this, see if you can express your inner experience of this deed of service as a gesture. So see if you can find a gesture that represents that deed of service for you. And then as a second question, find a time when you have been served by another person or another group. So when you've been on the, the receiving end of an act of service. And once again, see if you can find an inner gesture uh, for that experience. So when you go off into your breakout rooms, you can share your gestures if you like, uh, as well as uh, any, anything about that experience, those experiences that you'd like to share um, with your uh, sharing partners. So um, as is typical, we'll go into breakout rooms of, of three, and then we will, um, you'll have about three minutes each to share and then we'll come back and I'll turn it over to Carrie. And Chris, can you can you explain what you mean by gesture? Because I, I feel like that means a few different things. Sure. I mean, it could like uh, how, how could you express it with your body in some way? OK, like this. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. What is what does that gesture look like? If you could if you could take what's inside and, and express it on the outside, what would it look like? OK, great. I'm going to create the rooms and we'll see you all in how many minutes again? Uh, they'll have three minutes each, so we'll have, they'll be in there for about 10 minutes. Okay, and most of these are three. Uh, some of them might be four, though, so. Okay. Okay. Great. I think everyone is back. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, hope you enjoyed your sharing with your partners. Um, we have maybe just a, a minute or so. If, if anyone would like to, if anyone feels moved to share their gestures with the group without any, no, no commentary, if you would just like to share your, your gestures with, with everyone, raise your hand. No bold souls out there right now. 
Oh, All Lisa right. Hall. Oh, great. Let's Go for it, Lisa. Lisa. I think you should be, oh. Can... Oh, nice. Thank you, Lisa. Linda? Thank you. All right. Well, with that, I will pass it over to um, to Carrie. Am I passing it? Who am I passing Me. it to? I'm I passing it to Laura. <laughs> I have the honor of introducing Carrie. Thank you, Chris, so much for the beautiful biography work. It's so essential to this course that we're in together. Okay. So um, I wanted, I just feel so fortunate to know Carrie and um, I thought I would just start out by telling you about the first time I heard Carrie speak was at a graduation ceremony at Antioch University. And Carrie, you're about to talk to a group of Waldorf, um, soon to be Waldorf teachers. And I just remember the arc of the story, the, the journey you took us on as you talked about the needs of the world and the needs of children right now and how it all comes back to the children. And it was so beautiful. And I was so touched by that um, and so moved, moved to tears actually. And uh, since that time, you've really helped me personally understand so much about um, being active both spiritually and um, through initiative on the earth. So thank you for that. And, um, I wanted to say a little bit about House of Peace, which was founded um, by you and by John. Yes, it's 31 years ago. Very much so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, so it's in Ipswich, Massachusetts. And um, before this introduction is done, I'm going to read your mission because it's so extraordinary. Uh, but just so everybody knows, because we were in the initiative theme um, before and I meant to say before that you've taught me a lot about service, but also initiative, um, that you were in Camp Hill and you were a householder and a co-worker. And uh, you did that for 17 years, part of it in Northern Ireland and part of it in Pennsylvania. And that's where you met your first, um, you had the first refugee children um, come to live with you. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you just after I, I read the mission of the House of Peace. The mission of the House of Peace is to provide physical and spiritual shelter to victims of war in a small healing community in companionship with adults with special needs and to provide education for peace and moral awakening. Thank you so much for being here to, to open us into the theme of service, Carrie. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Tess, and Chris, and all of you that are in this virtuous circle throughout this nation tonight. We're having to look at a very broad theme, and yet a theme that is as deeply uh, intimate to each one of us as other themes that you have been working with, the theme of love, the theme of freedom, the theme of initiative. So tonight's thoughts have this title of service from conscious giving to sacred ritual. And we'll try to explore this by looking at these rhythms of assisting another and coming all the way to an act of homage and to look at the rhythms of serving and being served, to try to look at the hidden depths of each other within these rhythms. And I was thinking of some of you have probably been in a Eurythmy a situation in a circle and are passing copper balls and one hand is stretched out to receive and the other is ready to give that copper ball to another. And 
the circle is unbroken with this rhythm, so much like this rhythm that you have uh, spoken of love and of being loved. So tonight we would really want to explore all of this. And I know that you all are working with these rhythms that service is at the very core of the life of I'm sure everybody in our gathering tonight. I know we have Waldorf teachers and farmers and people working in many aspects of anthroposophy, working in many aspects of the environment. So a vast array of your work, your service, and that these are realities. And so we, we, we wanna have a different kind of sharing where it's more a kind of reflection. And even though it's through the lens for the first part of one person who feels very inadequate to this task, I can guarantee we really want to look at all that arises in our consciousness with this realm of service, maybe as a sharing, maybe even in some moments as a kind of meditative experience. And I hope that we can have this sense of gratitude and of joy, as well as the very sobering, sobering responsibilities that we have to look at in terms of on our path in anthroposophy, what is our duty in the realm of service to a very broken world? So I'd like to begin by orienting ourselves just for a few moments in the 10 days that we're in right now in March. And I'd like to begin, and Tess has been so good in helping with these slides that may not be uh, very bright, but they're what we want. And in this first one, we can reflect on the equinox that happened on March 20th and the dawn of spring and the equality of night and day and the sun being equally radiant on both sides of the earth, the return of light and the return of balance. And perhaps this gives us this equinox a kind of pre-Easter glimpse into the spiritual world, this attempt to prepare ourselves in such a way of serving and of being served by the beings of the spiritual world. And we know that tonight we're meeting in a time of great polarity where all balance has been for the past year in a most chaotic and disrupt disruptive way really thrown over. And so in this realm of so-called pandemic, this word that means all the people, we reflect on the equinox we've just been through as a time of a restoration of balance. Our next slide shows that we are on the path to Easter where this return of the light is really something so profound, but we, we still have to earn it. We still have to go through the still silent agonies in a way, as well as the jubilation and moments of the Holy Week. And I'd like to just share in these first words, a few excerpts of poems or images that may help us with this a little bit. On the path to Easter, we think from Christopher Fry's wonderful words. Thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to face us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul that we ever took. Affairs are now soul size. The enterprise is exploration into God. Where? are you making for? It takes so many thousand years to wake, but will you wake for pity's sake? Thank you, Chess. 
So we turn now to a biography for a moment of an ultimate act of awakening, a, an ultimate act of service. We've been told that greater love than this no one has and that he lay down his soul forces for the other. Indeed, that he lay down his life for the other. And with this next slide, I'd like to remind us that yesterday, March 23rd, was the 41st anniversary of the assassination of Archbishop Oscar Romero of El Salvador. And he represents certainly in my life, one of those who understood that truly taking up the path of services, taking up a path which we'll speak of a little later, a true emptying of oneself in order to be filled, in order to work within the community impulse for people who are in need, people who are suffering, people who must be served. One of my first foster sons at the House of Peace, Adolfo, came from El Salvador and shared a birthday. He was four years old, exactly his birthday when Romero, who had turned from being very conservative and awoke for pity's sake when he saw the massacres happening to the Salvadoran people and gave his life. In the next slide, we see his picture and we hear these words that he spoke the day before on, on the actual day that he died. In the name of God, in the name of this suffering people whose cry rises to heaven more loudly each day, stop the repression. And if God accepts the sacrifice of my life, may my death be for the freedom of my people. I will die, but the people will never perish. They will kill me, but I will rise again in the people of El Salvador. And translated there at the bottom of his photograph, the liberation cry of the people, of the community, is a cry that rises to heaven and that nothing and no one can stop. This Archbishop Romero celebrated mass in a convent in Santa Ana, El Salvador on March 24th. And as he finished reading the gospel and giving his homily, saying those words on behalf of the people, the community that needed service, a shot rang out and he laid down his life for others. Something beautiful that he said, leading us in a moment to the next part, Archbishop Romero, it moves one's heart to think, nine months before I was born, there was a woman who loved me deeply. She did not know what I was going to be like, but she loved me because she carried me in her womb. And in this next slide, we turn our thoughts to today's festival, which is nine months before Christmas day today, the Annunciation. And in this day, we experience the ultimate deed of service, which is the word of Mary, fiat, let it be done 
unto me and these beautiful gestures that were just given where one reaches out to serve and is served <clears throat> very much are these Maria gestures of Annunciation. And so for one of Rilke's poems, An Annunciation, simply the words, the gaze of this angel and the one with which she answered blended so much suddenly that everything else vanished. And what millions saw built and endured crowded inside of her, only her and this angel seeing and seeing I and whatever is beautiful to the eye, nowhere else, but right here. This is startling and it startled them both. Then the angel sang his song. And in this next slide, we see what is the song of this angel, the song of the servant. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior. And this has to do with service being, has everything to do with encounter. I, with my own inner I, I with the other, I with the angel, I with the spiritual beings, I in the deepest humility, I with the Godhead. There's a wonderful image that Applied Anthroposophy has been working with, I think, from the very beginning talk we had, if I remember correctly, and that's this image of the butterfly. And I think we should pause here in this enunciation moment because butterflies really come to mind. And for me, that's because I met once in the ancient Tenchi, which is the Japanese gospel of the hidden Christians of Japan, this community that carried the impulses and instructions of Christianity underground during fierce centuries, 250 years of persecution. And they wrote and they sang and they chanted all they could remember of their teaching. And their theme of the Annunciation we can think of with this next slide, namely that there hovered over Moria, Santa Moria, the butterfly who called her by name. And that butterfly flew into her mouth. And in that moment, Maria, Maria conceived the word. The word becomes then the logos. In Greek, this word butterfly is psyche or psyche. And we tonight, whether we think of ourselves as egg or caterpillar, chrysalis or cocoon, we can celebrate this, this announcing moment, this annunciation. Steiner says that the butterfly is the most spiritualized earthly substance, radiating spirit light into the cosmos. And so we have these days, of Annunciation, of Romero, of Equinox, of Spring. Thank you, Tess. We also know that 
in a few days on the 27th of March, we remember the death day of Dr. Carl Koenig, the founder of Camp Hill. And then on the 30th, the death day of Dr. Steiner. And so it's a 10 day span that we're in, kind of our own Holy Week, plus a few wonderful days to reflect on mighty beings that turn our thoughts to service. And so from Dr. Steiner, we hear the following, a call, which is what all of us are trying to respond to. And we're going to talk more in a little bit about the six epoch that just mentioned right here. The aim of the sixth epoch of humanity will be to popularize esoteric truth in the widest circles. That is the mission of that epoch. A society which is united in spirit has the task of carrying this esoteric truth everywhere right into life and applying, applying practically all of this. But says Rudolf Steiner, 1907, early on, applying this practically is precisely what is lacking in our age. And so we turn a little paradigm here, a little, a little star, our next slide that helps us maybe to look at some aspects of this path to service, a path of selflessness, a path to selfhood, a path of sacrifice that leads us to service, which then can be transformed to sacrament. This is a rotating star. We're never done with one point of this star. It's not linear. It's a process. And so we need to look at this process. Thank you, Tess. <clears throat> so the first part then is selflessness. And with this, like Maria's angel, we are met face to face. We encounter the stranger and we are asked to serve. We can only do that. We can only dare even attempt to do this in a mood, a kind of attitude, a being of selflessness. The stranger, who is this stranger? The God of Abraham, of Muhammad, and of Mary's fiat. The stranger is the welcoming God whom we welcome, the great yes that unites two into one. God at once, guest, host, and home. Like the Virgin of the Annunciation, the soul does not ask why or how, but only says yes. The frail guest that she carries in her womb determines thereafter all her conduct. The one that says, yes, I will serve. But this path will lead us from Annunciation and this beautiful image of Maria welcoming into her womb the light of the word of worlds to Golgotha and Maria at the foot of the cross and the Mary of the Pieta. Again from Steiner approaching the mystery of Golgotha. Under the influence of materialism, selflessness was lost to humanity in a way that we will recognize only in times to come. 
We can, however, regain a culture of selflessness by immersing ourselves in this mystery of Golgotha on the level of feeling by applying our entire soul being <clears throat> to the task. We can then say that what Christ did for earthly evolution is contained in the fundamental impulse of selflessness. And for the human soul's conscious evolution, Christ can become the school of selflessness. There's a beautiful book, I bet a lot of you know it, by Peter Sell, The Culture of Selflessness. And it links it so much to the fifth gospel. Our own study group is studying the fifth gospel. And of course, Peter has also a book on the fifth gospel. But this is a wonderful approach to Steiner's plea at a time of carnage of First World War and of rampant materialism and unbridled weaponry and violence as we're experiencing it right now. And Steiner's response to that was we must build a culture of selflessness. And this week as we're riveted on the tragedies that unbridled violence of guns and weapons it's visited upon this nation that visited is always there pointing even in nuclear weapons at the heart of this world and its people what's the answer this culture of selflessness because affairs are now soul size and we must wake up and create that culture anew. So St. Paul is a big help here and says, in regard to selflessness and service, we do it with new freedom. We do it in the life of the spirit, in the law, not of the old law, but in the new life of the spirit. And I'm sure reflecting on sessions on freedom, one can resonate with that. He says that it is through love that we will be servants of one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Serve the other as you would be served. I was, I was thinking, um, serving and being served and how hard it is sometimes to be served and this rhythm of selflessness is not at all confined to all be selfless and serve the other but i'll be selfless and let the other serve me and you know i I had to think of a, a beautiful experience that I had many, many years ago in regard to this when I um, had had a rather serious accident that involved um, during college and in, involved a, a, a serious fractures to the spine and required a lot of hospitalization and then people coming to take me for walks. And I had been enrolled as a great treat and privilege um, to take a course with the seniors of that college with a visiting professor Dietrich von Hildebrand on the philosophy of community. And I was just devastated that I would miss that course, but it turned out tragically and happily that he had a heart attack at the same time that I had broken my back. And we were both walking around the campus with helpers all the time together. And then I went to class one day, I was in a brace, he was work, walking slowly and I was at the end of this phenomenal lecture gathering up all my books to carry and he came to my desk and said, you must let me carry your books for you. I said, no, oh, professor, no, please. I, I, 
I can't let you do that. And he said something very profound. But if you don't let me do that for you, how else, if I cannot serve you, how else will I show you that I love you? And it brought home to me so much this theme of service connected with love in a culture of a community of selflessness. I'll just say that again. Service lives in a culture, in a community of selflessness. And we're going to go to St. Paul in Philippians. Sorry about, but it just happens that I realize there's so much help for us in grappling with all this in, in these words. So from second chapter of Philippians, if the power of the spirit word is in the being of Christ, if there is encouragement of the heart through the divine love, if we experience how the spirit makes us into a community, if there is tenderness and warm heartedness, then you can make my joy complete by directing your thinking and your whole minds toward the same aims, cultivate the same loving will, feel your souls to be intimately united, strive for harmony of thought between you, be imbued with the same state of mind, which also filled Christ. For though he was of divine nature and form, he emptied himself in offering and took on the form of a servant. Humbly and selflessly, he submitted to the laws of earth existence, even to the experience of death. There's a, a wonderful, powerful Greek word, kenosis, about this emptying. He emptied himself and Steiner in our work with knowledge of the higher worlds. We know how he speaks about this constant kenosis, this, this, this hard work of emptying ourselves out in order that we be filled. And by doing this, we come to realize service is a healing power. Again, Paul, work with anxious effort, work with trembling expectation to the end that the realm of healing power may open to you. You are to shine among human beings like the bright stars in the sky by keeping to the word of life. And so in the midst of all this selflessness, there's a great deal of joy. It's not easy to be emptied out ever, ever, but there's a tremendous gratitude that comes when our fiat and our emptying and our yes opens us to a new kind of fullness. <clears throat> If you were to ever look up Being Human, Summer Issue 2020, you'll find there a wonderful talk that Chris Schaefer gave to a group that I'm a part of, the North American Council, on sacramental conversation, the practice of mutuality. I recommend you go to that where he speaks about service being related to community, that service is a karmic situation. We learn each other by serving each other and being served by each other. And it makes us think of this service in a time of pandemic. How should we do that? Don't touch. Don't get near. Keep your distance. Wear your mask. Zoom in to the other. Where shall we serve us tonight, coming out of this, hopefully coming out of this time? How can we restore the forces of conscious conversation, of conscious 
serving? How can we overcome these distances and unmask each other because our souls have frozen over in this long, dark winter? We've become, in a way, because we had to operate with our iPhone and our iPads in this I generation, we've fallen victim to a kind of distancing from this selfless closeness of service. So let's, let's work on that. And we moved into selfhood. And again, we are given by Steiner this image of the macrocosm, the microcosm, the expansion, the contraction, the constant rhythm of of moving ourselves out into the world to serve and of contracting into our own uh, cocoon sometimes in order to maybe regenerate in order sometimes to hide. How, how do we move through selflessness into selfhood? The individual human eye is being prepared to become the bearer of humanity's eye. The human being is becoming humanity. Humanity as a whole lives in the individual. We're very familiar with Steiner's mandate here. Why do we have to apply anthroposophy? How do we apply anthroposophy? And he gives this first, he gives this image in many ways. This is how it is in verse form. You seek for the light of the spirit world. Seek within yourself and you will find it. You seek for yourself's being. Seek in world unfolding and you will find it. Our own being's darkness darkens the world. And listen here, what a warning from him. Not to know the workings of the world chills the self. And that's somewhere how this has to be coming through this winter the self is chilled, the self of the other is chilled. And it's this Philippian warm heartedness, this, this true loving that's a power and a force as, as you've heard so much. Gandhi puts it in a beautiful way. The best way to this selfhood, to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. And this path will lead us to that moment of selfhood when we say, not I, but Christ in me. But we have to ask, we have to work, we have to struggle, we have to fail, we have to get up and try again and again to find the true I of the self. It's why we have knowledge of the higher worlds. It's why we have our exercises, our meditation, all of it. But it's why we have community where we have each other in the image that we are seeking this not I but the Christ in me and personally I, I find that one way to to reach out to this selfhood this kind of mantle of self or this this being within that I long to be, the being that others will call forth in me, we can turn in prayer and meditation to the seven I am sayings that we find in the St. John's Gospel. The Christ saying, I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the gate or the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life the way, the truth, the life. I am the true vine, this wonderful image of community. I am your community 
being. And that then makes for us in terms of service also utterly and totally mandatory that we turn to the realm of the dead. Who am I? What is my selfhood in order to serve? What is my selfhood in relation to the vast community, the karmic community to which I belong on the other side? Service is a deed of community. It lives in a culture of community. We can't go into it now maybe, but we must serve the dead even as constantly they are serving us. So then we move around our star to that word sacrifice. We've explored an emptying process of selflessness, a discovery process of selfhood. And now we come to that moment when we have to say, what is the soul spiritual attitude that prepares us for service? What is sacrifice? When we have emptied ourselves and when the I that I am and the I that the Christ is fills us, what shall we do to become holy and to make holy, to sacrifice from Steiner. Humanity will be fully present. And here we come to the sixth epoch, which I know you wonderfully spoke about and it was wonderful in the last panel. Somebody asked the question, our friend with the beautiful gestures tonight, well, what really is the sixth epoch about? Steiner. Humanity will be fully present only when it becomes possible for one individual's pain to be felt not only by the person in question, but also by someone else. This is the ideal that still eludes us. In the future, the spiritual aspect of the human being will become so strong that the pain of a person with an injured body will be felt not only in that person's consciousness, but also equally keenly by others. Someday, someday we will be able to feel another person's injury as acutely as if it were our own. That is the Christ ideal. And at times like this, it is good to remember this ideal. Spine, Steiner spoke those words, war and injury in carnage. There's an Arabic word, badalia, for substitution, to take another person's place in battle and suffering. That's what Steiner's talking about, but he's not saying Let's all wait for the next epoch. He's saying we have to prepare the epoch. We have to do it now. We have to find ways to the pain of the other. Real, real ways. Novalis, you know these words, I'm sure. Whoever flees pain will love no more. Love is always to feel the opening, to hold the wound always open. And that's so much what we humbly try to experience at this house of peace when people come burned and dismembered and broken in soul and body. We can't erase the wound. We must hold the wound always open. And so from sacrifice, we come to service and this attitude of humility 
of readiness, of awakening, of willingness, of emptiness, of fullness. And a lot of you know this wonderful um, poem of Christian Morgenstern on the kingdoms, so to speak, of service, the washing of the feet. I thank you, dumb and silent stone. I bend in reverence to you. My life and growth is plant to you, I owe. I thank you, fruitful earth and flower. I bow my head in reverence to you. You helped me rise to animals' estate. I thank you, stone and plant and beast. I make obeisance lowly to you all. Tis you have helped me to my human self. So flows thanksgiving ever back and forth in the divine whole, manifold yet one, entwining all with threads of thankfulness. The nature kingdoms are alive with the washing of the feet. And one week from tonight will be Maundy Thursday, the washing of the feet, the events of Holy Week, this Holy Thursday. With this slide of Magdalene and the event that's described in the Luke Gospel, we can see this woman, if you will look closely with her alabaster vessel of ointment. She anoints the feast of the Christ with oil, with tears, with kisses, we're told. And there's great objection on the part of all the men gathered there, why should she waste precious oil? Why does he let her weep at his feet and kiss his feet? And the Christ says, her many sins are forgiven because she has anointed me with her tears and her kisses because she has shown much love. There's an incident of St. Basil the Great going to visit a remote monastery famous for its ascetic life and prayer and meditation and rituals of this group of holy men living all alone. And he simply said, all very wonderful, but whose feet will they wash? Thank you, Tess. After this anointing by this woman who John calls Mary of Bethany, the Christ himself gets up from table takes a towel, puts it around him, bends down and one by one goes to wash the feet of each apostle. It's the ultimate act of service, the kneeling down of the Godhead to wash the feet of us. And we know Peter says, no, no, you will never wash my feet. No, no, you cannot serve me like this. And the Christ says, Peter, do you not understand what I have done for you? You must wash each other's feet. You owe it to each other to wash one another's feet. I, says the Christ, have given you this example. So may you may do for one another what I have done for you. 
a servant is not greater than his master. And this next picture of this child, our close beloved guest at the House of Peace is a hard one to see, but it's what we live with here. This is the child Zahar. And when she came with her legs blown away from a car explosion in Baghdad, we had to confront this question. What can be said here? How shall I wash her feet? And the only answer we can give is with tears and kisses, hoping our sins and our failures here to serve all the forces we must serve with, that these sins will be forgiven because when we look at her, we can love much. The principles and purposes of the House of Peace state that we intend to confront the suffering of the world and its displaced people with a thought of the heart manifested in community life, where some of the givers of healing are the bearers themselves of wounds, of handicaps, of disabilities. We must welcome the other, the stranger, the neighbor who is closer than all our close ones without reserve, without calculation, whatever it costs at any price. Joseph and Ziad, both of them blind. Here, my sister Mary Ellen with many cognitive and physical disabilities, who else can sit and rock the carriage of the newborn babe from Kut in Iraq, whose sister was here in order that her life be saved to the service of doctors and nurses. The inner core of the existence of these people is not only infinite, but holy and divine. They are all part of the Godhead from which they came, to which they will return, and from which they will come again, words of Dr. Koenig. Any crippled and disfigured life, he says, is only one of many lives on their way back to the Father. Our service always awaits and expects the stranger, every stranger, with open hearts. It extends home, heart, gifts, and ultimately even life itself to the other, whether invited or not. A true servant is ready to give his or her life for the guest, and the converse is also true, the host and the guest are interchangeable. Barbara, from the planet of Buddha, Sean from Uganda, the kitchen of the house of peace. Who else has a lap big enough to hold this gorgeous boy? serving and being served. Thank you, Tess. And so we turn then to this wonderful verse that Dr. Steiner gives that we can say to those in pain, once we have activated somehow 
our forces of compassion and entered into with our listening hearts the suffering of the other, I can say to that person, as long as you feel pain that I avoid, Christ remains unrecognized at work in cosmic being, for weak is the spirit that can feel suffering only in its own body. And so finally, we come to these questions, service, it, it's not easy. Dorothy Day quoted Dostoevsky always, love or service in action is a harsh and dreadful thing as compared with love in our dream life. We often quote Vincent de Paul, we must give in such a way that we can be forgiven for it. And again, from the sixth epoch, this service as creative force in the world, we have to serve, we have to prepare this epoch through our communities, our families, our groups, our schools, our friendships, our sense of solidarity with others, connects us with the spiritual world. Our work is of great significance in that world because we are in those worlds. And to feel the pain of another being brings us closer to those worlds. In our moments right now in the world of confusion and chaos, emerging, we hope, from this COVID cocoon, this chrysalis that we hope it will be, birthing new butterflies that somehow do have this least materialistic substance. That's what we're working for right in this moment. We are all talking about being in this together, but we have this paradox of our distancing from each other, as I've already said. This is for us right now to overcome because the mysteries are happening where we are. The paradoxes, the polarities are all too present to us. It's a moral crisis. It's an anti-social moral crisis. Me first, America first, protect yourself, save yourself. How shall I serve in this moment? Borders children, thousands upon thousands of children. You've seen them in the recent days on floors wrapped in foil blankets for warmth. Still in steel cribs and cages separated. That's what our life is here. These borders, these walls, these boundaries, these travel bans is waiting for our children to come to us from Syria, Iraq, Iran, the burns, the wounds. This is our time for service. And so finally, with our star, we come to these last few moments. We return to sacrament. Our task, Steiner, is to take the knowledge bestowed by the gods on human beings in earlier days and brought down as a stimulus to our thought. We must offer it up again at the altar of the gods. This altar of the gods, that's us, built within us because we are the temple. The other person is the temple. We bear within us, we build within us the universal altar upon which the ultimate service, service, sacred ritual, a service takes place. And just as we said in the upper room that we visit next week on Holy Thursday that has a Hebrew, Muslim, Christian walls, we come to that Last Supper 
in this fourfold wholeness, in this final picture of this Last Supper and of the Christ who has washed the feet, leaving us with the ultimate purpose of the gospel, love in service, the ultimate purpose. They then eat the Passover lamb, the offering. Christ is the Passover lamb. And then the bread is taken and the wine is taken and there's transubstantiation. And the spiritual illumined and all is transformed and earthly substance is forever changed. And then the farewell discourse, Christ in the word gives himself. And this then is our, these are the walls, the four walls of the temple of our rituals of service. We read the gospel of each other's needs and pains. We offer ourselves in sacrifice to serve. We experience illumination, change, transforming, transubstantiation on the altar of our own being. And finally, we go out in community with these farewell words of the Christ. Whoever would serve me must follow me on my way. Where I am, there also must be the one who would serve me. And my father will honor the one who serves me. And so we come full circle to what I call a kind of Sophia sacrament, a Sophianic sacrament. We go back to the Annunciation. We go back to the Maria who said, yes, behold the servant of the Lord. Thomas Merton's poetry of this moment says, when God who sends the messenger meets his messenger in her heart, her answer between breath and breath rings from her innocence, our sacrament in her body, God becomes our bread. And so, so that, that's it, that's this star, this five pointed star. And Steiner's last, you know, in the Christmas farewell, the Christmas foundation meeting farewell, where he confirms that we're all part of a community within a culture of love and of service. He simply says, go forth with warm hearts to perform strong health giving actions, deeds of service in this world. Rilke says it too, work of the eyes is done. Go now and do hard work. So thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. I think we'll just have a minute or two of quiet. So we'd like to do that. Thank you.
<clears throat> so, um, again, thank you so much. That was, I, I know. I know I need to like buckle in when you start to talk because I'm going to go on a journey with you. And I, I'm sure many people here felt that same profound journey through this star to our stars with the stars. I mean, just so beautiful. Thank you for opening us to what service is and can be. And so um, I'm actually like, not quite sure what to do now i have to be frank because it feels kind of funny to open to questions and answers after that but i thought what we could do is is if people want to share something or if they do have a question um we'd love to hear we'd love to hear from them so we just have a little bit of time and we'll make sure we everyone gets the resources um one of the questions i think i'll just ask it's in the chat is <clears throat> the source of the star um, is that something that you, I, I really feel like I can carry this with me and as a guide. So could you talk about it a little bit? So it, it just came in the course of um, trying to reflect on this reality of service having so much to do with these aspects of selflessness and then it, it's just a personal star that came to me that kind of was uh, shining in this time of trying to discover with you all it you know it's so humbling because when I think of all of you and the amount of service that you are offering to so many every day um, again, it's one person's lens, but that's the five pointed star. We have this wonderful Eurythmy gathering here in person in our large gathering hall at the House of Peace. And so we often walk this five pointed star and that's how it came. Thank you. So that's, that star came out of you. <laughs> and your work and those you're with. Thank you, Terry. So any anybody wanna share or ask a question? You can raise your hand and we'll see you. Oh. Well, I think we've all been so moved. I mean, I, I can say for myself, I'm so moved and um, so grateful. So maybe we can just um, let people unmute themselves and say, thank you, Carrie. And I really hope to come visit you sometime and see your, your beautiful center where you heal people and heal the earth and where we all can learn how to heal each other. Thank you for, for being here and being here with us today. Thank you so much. <laughs> so if people wanna just unmute and say thank you, we'll take that spotlight thank off you, and everyone Carrie. can say goodbye. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you so much. Thank you.